thanks for my friend and Navy friend, Brother Cleveland Ewing, out there in Georgia as well. Lord, I believe you're moving upon their life, upon the life of his family, his household. And we speak, Father, move in your mighty power. Continue to heal. Continue to deliver and set free. Have your way, Lord. And Father, we pray for those that are grieving during this season as a result of the loss of a loved one. Those that are depressed may be suffering some kind of oppression in their minds. We speak in the name of Jesus that they are being comforted, they are being healed, they are being consoled by your mighty power. In the name of Jesus, we ask you to have your way, Lord. We ask, Father, that a word will be said to encourage their hearts, to lift their spirit, cause them to believe again. Yes, cause them to believe again. In the name of Jesus. Now we thank you for these that are here. Those that are listening virtually. We pray, Father, that your word will strengthen, encourage, and inspire us all. That we will be better as a result of Christ coming, not only just into the world, but coming into our hearts. You came into my heart one day. You came into other's hearts one day. And oh, what a change you've made in our lives. So we speak today that others will still experience the change in their heart. Not to just be a church member or a church visitor, but to have a renewed experience of the love and spirit of God in their heart. In the name of Jesus. Now we thank you for this opportunity to spread a word of hope and inspiration. And I ask you now that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart will be acceptable in your sight. For you are my strength and my redeemer. I also ask, Father, that you would touch every heart, those that are listening. And may their hearts be open and receptive to the word and the will of God. That as the words depart from my lips, that you will send your anointing with it, that their hearts will be turned toward you, their lives will be changed, they'll be transformed in the renewing of their mind. We give you glory, we give you honor and praise for it all in the precious name of Jesus, and we all say amen, 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 amen. and amen. Again, God bless you, God bless you. It's again, we are here to share a word of encouragement, a word of hope to you and with you. And I'm so glad. I want to say to you, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Hallelujah. Merry Christmas. And I'm praying that God will bless us with a blessed and a prosperous new year. And uh, I'm praying also that our lives will reflect the very image of Christ more in the upcoming year. And that God, we pray that you will be pleased with us. How many of you want the Lord to be pleased with you? Yes. You know, when parents are pleased with you, you get extra benefits. Uh, Amen. They go out of their way to do nice things for you and all of that. So the Lord said, if we being evil know how to give good gifts right. to our children. He said, how much more? How much more? Our heavenly Father who loves us Amen. will meet our needs and come and give us his heart. So that's my prayer, that God will continue to draw us closer to him and as a result, we will experience what it means to be close. That little song says, just to be close to you Amen. is my desire. I want to be closer to him. Amen? Amen. Don't y'all want to be a little closer to him? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to be closer. I married my wife because I want to be a little closer to her. <laughs> I didn't want nobody else to get her. And God then to let me, but when I was introduced to her, I saw something in her that sparkled and caught my eye, but then this man, as I began to dialogue and talk with her and ask questions, I realized, wow, yes, God does have somebody for the brother. He said, to him, our life has never been the same. Amen. Amen. I told my mama one time, I said, I guess God hadn't made nobody for me. I'd just be a single bachelor the rest of my life. And in one way, I committed my heart to the Lord and my life to the Lord. And I meant that 
but deep down inside, I still wanted to have a loving relationship that I saw through the eyes of my mom and my dad. Mm -hmm. I wanted to have a family, but I'm like, Lord, if I got to live single as a bachelor, I'll do that. But I would like to have a wife. And the Lord answered the brother's prayer. Amen. I remember going to a wedding one day, and I said to myself, and I prayed this prayer secretly. I said, Lord, next year at this time, I would like to have a, a wife to walk this journey with me. Because I just joined the Navy, and I needed a uh, I knew I was going to be traveling and going, and I'm like, I would like to have a, a good companion to take this journey of experience and this Christian journey with me. And I said, next year this time, and listen, folks, in a matter of a few months, I was introduced to my girlfriend. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, I'm like, wow, God is real. He does answer prayer. Mm -hmm. So for those of you that may be doubting and wondering if God still answers prayer, even those of you that are watching virtually. And sometimes we can be to that place where we, we try and do our best and things didn't come to fruition. Try God. And I made that vow to him. I said, you give me one of your best ladies out there, God, I vow to you that I'll take good care of her. And I just left it at that because he knows more about what I need than I did, right? Yeah. <laughs> and yes, he surprised me. And so far, God has blessed me to take good care of her. Amen. Amen. See, she said amen. Uh, <laughs> and I wasn't looking at her to get her to say it either. <laughs> God is good. God is good. So listen, God bless you today. I'm so delighted to be able to share a word of hope and encouragement with you again today. And again, you know the rule. Call your friends. Call your friends. Call your neighbors. And tell them again, yep, yeah, your favorite pastor is back. <laughs> Call them and tell them your favorite pastor is back. And I have a word to encourage you. It's not very deep today. It's going to be a little light, but uh, I believe it will bless you. Amen? Amen? Yes, yes, yes. So I want to speak to you today about your world, your world. Yeah. I'm speaking not so much concerning geographically, you know, so, you know, when you talk about the world, you know, you think about regions and territories. But I'm speaking more so of our emotional world, our environmental context in which we live. Yeah, our surroundings. Emotionally, watch this. We can experience peace, joy, and hope in our world. Or we can live in a state of sadness, a state of bewilderment. A state of pain and grief and hopelessness. Some people are living in despair and in fear. But I want to challenge us this morning to lighten your world. Lighten your world. Maybe you've been battling a long term of illness. or Maybe you are a caregiver like I know our friend and uh, brother Fred and brother uh, Daughty. Maybe you have become a caregiver, and this has been going on for a while, and we understand this can take a toll on us. Amen? Amen. But how many of you know our God is a healer? Amen. Our God can sustain and help us through whatever challenge that we may face. So I come to encourage you this morning during this special holiday season. Maybe you've been battling anxiety or depression as a result of all of the isolation or the loneliness, or the frustration resulting from the COVID, or what have you, I want to encourage you today, during this holiday season. Whatever your situation is, I want to encourage you this Christmas season, as I told you before, that Jesus is still the answer. I told you a few weeks ago that God's word is the answer. I told you to trust him, trust his word, trust his love, and believe, right? Mm -hmm. I told you that God's word is the answer. I told you God's, that Jesus is the answer. And I challenge us to trust his word and believe upon him. We cannot always control what happens to us in this life, my friends. But listen, we can choose how we respond to what happens. Amen? Amen? We can't control life. Sometimes life does things and throws curves that are far out of our control. 
But we can choose. Somebody say, I can choose. I can choose. How I respond. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we can choose. So since we can choose, when we choose to look on the positive side or take the high road, our view becomes clearer. What am I saying? God did not promise everything, promise us that everything would go well every day. He didn't promise that, did he? He did not say every day was going to be sunny and you're going to just never have any pain or no, no struggle. He didn't say that. But he did promise us one thing. Well, actually many things. But one thing he promised, he said, I will be with you. Whenever you're going through. In the Old Testament, he told me, he said, even when you're going through the fire, I'll be with you and the fire won't consume you. When you're going through the flood, the waters won't overtake you. And all those were metaphorical metaphors for situations that comes in this life. Amen? Amen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've talked to you about that. So this morning, as a result of the previous messages, I want to challenge you through our Almighty God in the Spirit of Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit, to lighten your world. Very uh, familiar scripture that we are coming from is Matthew chapter 5. You all probably remember those verses by heart. Matthew chapter 5. And I'm going to read from the 13th verse through the 16th verse. Just prior to this, Jesus had just given them the Beatitudes. You know, blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the merciful. He talked about those things. And he given them some consolation as to whatever category they fell in. He gave them some consolation. But I want to go down to the 13th verse. When we talk about light in your world. He says, 13th verse, and you are the salt of the earth. Y'all see that? Mm -hmm. But if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? In other words, it is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden on the foot of men. In other words, you guys are familiar with salt, right? Mm -hmm. You can take salt, fresh salt, whether it's sea salt or fresh salt, and as long as it's containerized and it's preserved, that salt, when you shake it over your meat or season something, you can tell, oh yeah, that's salt. Mm -hmm. It seasons things, right? But if you take salt, just kind of lay it out, and just let it dry out in the open and the, the elements hit it, after a while, that salt turns into just white stuff. <laughs> you can taste it and it doesn't have any kind of hearty taste in it if it sit out long enough, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what the writer of Jesus is implying here. He said, if the salt has lost its savor, then wherewith shall, uh, wherewith he says, shall it be salted. He said, it's thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men. The 14th verse said, you are the light of the world. Y'all see that? Mm -hmm. Tell your neighbor, light in your world. Light in your world. You're like a city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. And then he goes on and said, neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick so that it gives light unto their all those that are in the house. And 16 goes on to say, so let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. Amen? Amen. Yes. So tell you, neighbor, light in your world. Light in your world. You may be seated. You may be seated. Thank God for you. And uh, again, I want to encourage us today and particularly during this holiday season, lighten your world. Lighten your world. Lighten your world. Again, as a result of the previous messages, I want to challenge you through our Almighty God and the Holy Spirit and through Jesus Christ who came into the world that we might have life again. Y'all have life again? Amen. I have life again as a result of what Christ did. You know, a lot of times people talk about what 
James did, but listen, what James did didn't mean very much. But what Christ did for James sums it all up. Amen? Amen. What Christ did for you. When he came into the world and the scriptures this morning was so encouraging and so delightful talking about Christ coming into the world. You know, he was able to humble himself and become obedient unto Christ, unto God, his father. Listen, and just to insert this parenthetically, one thing about being obedient, you know, it's hard to be obedient when you don't trust somebody. It's hard to be obedient to them when you don't like them. It's hard to be obedient to them when you feel like you know more than they know, right? It's hard to be obedient to people like that. But Christ came and humbled himself so that he would be obedient to his heavenly father. Yes. Knowing the consequences of his obedience and knowing where it was going to lead him, he still humbled himself. He made a choice, didn't he? Yes. To, be, to become humbled so that he will be obedient to his father. Now, how does that relate, Pastor Hitch? I'm glad you asked. You did ask that, didn't you? Because, mm -hmm. see, Christ is a part of the Godhead. Y'all know the Godhead. God the Father, the God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, right? The three makes one. When you read about Christ, when you read about John, I mean Genesis, when he talks about in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, Christ was with him. The Holy Spirit. And God was one and the same in that mix, right? Mm -hmm. When you go to John 1, and John says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. He said the same was in the beginning. Christ was in the beginning with God and with the Word. All of those three, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit made one. Christ was a part of that package. Mm -hmm. Y'all hear me? Mm -hmm. So, when man after man had sinned and fallen and fell short, years and years went by when we could not, we were not connected with God. You all remember back in Genesis in the Old Testament when God said the world was just desperately wicked and nobody was seeking after God, so God destroyed the world. And listen, we didn't have a connection with God then for years. But in the eons of time, the Lord realized we still, he still wanted to have relationship with his people. He wanted to have relationship with Israel, not just with Israel, but with his body of believers, with the disciples. He wanted to have relationship with us. Amen. So he said, I need somebody other than animals and bullocks and goats and sheep and all that. He said, I need a permanent sacrifice because the doves and the sheep and the goats and all of those uh, animals that were being offered as a result of sin, they were just a type and shadow of what was to come in the future. God was introducing to us or to them back then what he wanted <coughs> for the world. Therefore, in the eons of time, he sent Christ. Christ said, Father, prepare me a body, and I'll go down and redeem man back to you. And thank God, he was not like some of us. He decided, even in his holiness, he decided to allow God to just strip him of all of that. And the Bible tells us in, in the Gospels, he came down through the Virgin Mary. <laughs> Somebody said miraculous. miraculous. You know, God, you, you know, man said there's more than one way to skin a cat. Well, listen, God said there's more, more than one way that I could do anything. And he sent the virgin, Mary called on Mary, and she was a pure virgin, and God, through the Holy Spirit, implanted baby Jesus. And here we are. He was born. And he says, what that one verse said, Behold the Lamb of God coming to take away the sins of the world. What does that mean? In other words, we have a chance now to have relationship with God again. Relationship. Somebody said relationship. relationship. 
And that means, listen, that means now I have somebody, I have an advocate through Jesus Christ, but then God sits on the throne and he still says, come unto me, all you that are laboring and are heavy laden, and he says, I'll give you rest. One time, for a long time, I thought, well, what kind of rest? You know, if you don't have a job that's all stressful and it's not too hard, it's not working too hard, you don't need much rest. But that wasn't the kind of rest he was talking about. He was talking about rest from weariness, rest from a troubled soul, rest from having anxiety and stress and, and depression and all of this stuff that life brings as a result of the struggle that we are faced with, right? Mm -hmm. So Christ said, I'll give you rest from that. Jesus put it this way. He said, my peace I give to you. My peace I'll leave with you. Then he said, don't let your heart be troubled. And don't be afraid. Now, friend, just having the peace of God alone is enough to just want to say, Lord, I surrender to you. Come into my heart. Because nowadays, all of, the pe all of the struggle and the confrontation and the rebellion that's going on in the world and things that we want to fix and we can't, just having the peace of mind brings content to my heart. And if you like me, you will agree. Listen, the peace that God brings to us and gives to us goes further than having all of the money or all of the riches or all of the finest things of life. Just having the peace of God. Because watch this. You can have all of the finest things and people still don't have the peace of God. Y'all follow me? People got money and they still don't have the peace of God of God. The scripture declares there is a peace that surpasses our understanding. That's the kind of peace that Christ comes to give us. So during this holiday season, it's a good time to not only just get to know God if you don't know him. It's a good time to get to know him, right? But if we already know him, I want to encourage us today to lighten our world. Lighten our world, and I'm going to show you what that looks like here in, in our scriptures. Jesus said, you are the light of the world, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. That simply means now that you've accepted me in your heart, and I've come into the world, and I've afforded you the opportunity to become the Christian that you are. He said, now you are the light of the world. That means we have something special that the world don't have, folks. I know you may say, oh, well, I work on a job, but, you know, I'm not the highest on the totem. I'm low rank and all of that. That doesn't matter. You are still the light to that world where you live. Amen. You are the light on your job. You are the light in your home. Just by chance, if you are living in a place where you're the only ones that save or profess in Christ, you are that light. And I challenge you to lighten your world. Lighten that world up. And I'm going to give you some tips on how to lighten your world up. All right? So look at this with me here. Hebrews 13, verses 1 through 6. The Lord has promised that he would be with us. He promised that he will never leave us. So I'm going to just go there real quick. Hebrews 13. Let's look at it real quick. Hebrews 13. And we just want to look at the first six verses. <coughs> we start out by saying, let brotherly love continue. Y'all see that? Mm -hmm. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels, and they were not even aware of it. Mm -hmm. So, how you going to lighten your world? There are going to be people around you that you may not even know. I'm encouraging us. Reach out to them. Get to know them. Find out what their needs are and in what kind of way can you contribute in helping to meet that goal. Maybe they're lonely. They're isolated. Maybe they're having a lack of funds during this season and you might have the ability that you can help them get a little further along in life. Maybe they have some situations of anxiety 
and you can share a word or scripture to encourage them and enlighten. In other words, lighten your world. He says, remember them that are in bonds as being bound with them, and them which suffer adversity as being yourself also in the body of dealing with that same kind of adversity. Have you ever noticed sometimes you can, you can be at a, whether you're at a supermarket or you're in your neighborhood, you can be walking by. Sometimes I'm driving in my car, and you know, you ever took a look over to the next car that pull up beside you? And sometimes you can look on the person's face and see what kind of mood they're in, pretty much. And sometimes, man, look like I drive up and I'm stopping at a sign, and I'm just having to glance over to the side, and look like sometimes I see people look like they're so stressed. I look like they're so weary. And I'm like, oh, Lord, I wonder what their day is like. And I say a little prayer as I'm pulling off away because, you know, you don't have time to dialogue with them. But sometimes even in the supermarket, you can be in the supermarket, and while you are so busy waiting to pay for your uh, goods to move on in the supermarket, sometimes even Christians, we see people in the line with us, and we don't say a word. They're in front of us, and sometimes they're behind us in the line over here. And a lot of times, all we can think about is myself. Why can't they hurry up and get this line moving so I can go home and cook my collard greens? <laughs> if I have the light in me, and as Christians, you have the light in you, I would think at some moment in time, we would be quickened by the Spirit to say, you know, at least speak to the folk. Say, so how you doing? Is everything okay? Uh, Merry Christmas to you. Uh, you know, a lot of times if you can't think about anything else, if they got kids, talk about the children. Oh, you have beautiful kids or something. But do something to lighten their world. Because at least they are in, you say, well, I can't lighten the world, Pastor. The world is too big. I'm not talking about the big world. I'm talking about your world. Your world consists of those that are around you, right? My world consists of those that are around me. You stand in that line and listen, especially during this special season, and you, you see that there's more than three, and you, they, look like they, they may be struggling. Listen, talk to the teller and tell her, hey, I'm going to pay for their, their groceries. I'm going to pay for their packages. Just go ahead and... Uh, let me take care of that. I'll leave some money here for you to take care of that and ring them up and just take care. Let's lighten other, other people's world. Other words, not just to think and focus on ourselves because that's easy, right? But think about those times, and this will help us to do it. Think about those times when you were without or when you were lonely or when you didn't have the wherewithal to do all the things that you are able to do now. And no doubt, God had somebody to come alongside you, somebody that would inspire you, somebody that would give to you and share their, what they had with you. I know it happened in my life. I can remember so vividly when I first joined the military in the Navy, and I went to Cuba, and then after that, I was sent to California. And you're talking about some the expressions of love that was shown to me through people that didn't even know me. I remember one particular incident when I told them, I said, I'm newly married and I'm looking for a house to live in for my wife so I can bring her out here because I was just in the Navy. Now, I hadn't been in the Navy maybe a year almost. And I didn't qualify for the, the military housing yet. You know how that go. So I just put it out there. I'm like, I'm looking for a place to stay because I'm going to bring my wife. And, uh, and there were people that just rallied. Didn't even know James from anything. They just rallied and talked to each other. And next thing I know, oh, such and such has a place that they'll be able to rent to you. And I didn't have the wherewithal. I didn't have the money to take care of it all on my own. And they rented me the house fully furnished. <laughs> it was so amazing to me. I'm like, and this was at the little church that I was I'd going to. And I just happened to mention it and ask her to put it in the bulletin that this young sailor is looking for a place to live so he can get his wife out here. And this dear mother of the church had a house sitting right next to the church virtually. And 
She said, I'm never there because I'm spending time with my relatives. I'm an evangelist. I'm always on the road and I'm never there. And sure enough, she was never there. <laughs> she said, you guys, you can just rent this house. I'm like, well, we can bring in our furniture and our linens and stuff. And, you know, we got a lot of gifts when we got married. She said, no, you don't even have to unpack that, huh? She was lighting her world, and by lightening her world up, she was lightening our world. Y'all follow me? She didn't even know me. Then after a series of time that we stayed there, I needed another place because uh, they were coming back. And uh, well, again, we put the bulletin in. We are looking for another place. <coughs> I'm getting ready to go out to see, and I didn't want to leave by herself. And another woman says, you know what? I have a big house. She can come and share the house with me. Now, if I was too proud and too arrogant and obnoxious, I could have said, I don't want to do that. I want my own place. But no, I wasn't going to even be there. So I humbly took her up on that offer, and we paid her what she wanted, and my wife was able to stay with her. It was a big house. Nobody was in the house but the, the woman. So... We lightened her world by giving her some. My wife was there to talk and share with her, and she was able to give us a space for, for a certain number of months while I was gone. That's what I'm talking about, lighting somebody's world. Listen, it doesn't take a whole lot for us to do this. We just have to have a mind to think about others more than we thinking about ourselves, right? Amen. He went on to say, marriage is honorable in all and the bed under fire, but Four moments than adulterers, God will judge. But uh, the fifth verse says, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. Watch this now. For he has said, I will never leave thee, nor will I forsake thee. So what you saying here, Pastor? He's saying here, let's learn to be content with where we are. Not that I don't have ambition, I don't desire to do better, but Wherever I am, rather than having anxiety and stressing and worrying about doing something bigger and better, just learn to be content where you are. Knowing that God has got me in the palm of his hand. And listen, as I live for him and do what he's calling me to do, in just a matter of time, he's going to open up the door. And what you mean, Pastor? I mean open up the door. Literally open the door up so that you can do better. That same analogy, we shared the house with this precious mother at the church in California. And my wife was telling me one day we would go visit to some of the other friends' houses. And some of them had new houses. And they had nice places. And they were getting furniture and all of that. And my wife came home one day. She was a little sad. And I'm like, what's the matter, dear? Didn't you enjoy our outing? And uh, she said, yeah. But she says, I would like to have my own house. And it kind of hit me. I'm like, yeah, I know. I know. But I said, don't you know God is faithful? Right. I'm like, God is faithful. I said, literally, we really don't need a house right now because you're going back to Carolina and you're going to spend time with your folks or you're going to spend time. And I'm, I'm here temporarily, so the house really wouldn't benefit us a whole lot right now, right? Otherwise, what I was saying, I was trying to help her to understand, let's just be content where we are right now knowing that the Lord would not leave us and he's not going to forsake us, right? right? And guess what happened, folks? As soon as my tour was up there in California, I had orders to go to North Carolina. I love North Carolina. Wilmington, North Carolina. Right there on the beach, too, near the beach. And I leave from a, sharing a house with this mother, precious soul, goes to North Carolina, I'm looking around for something to rent. See, this is how, how, how God likes our world. I'm looking for a place to rent because I didn't make a whole lot of money at the time and I couldn't afford a whole lot. And every time I found a place that I liked, the rent was worth more than a mortgage would be. So I'm like, Lord, what are you saying to me? I don't want to pay a whole lot of rent for something that, and it's not even, it's subpar to where I would like to live. So the Lord just dropped it in my spirit one day, and I asked the lady, I said, I asked the realtor, I said, don't they have any new construction around here? <laughs> I was mighty bold to ask that, right? 
Here I am making peanuts. And I just ask out of the blue, don't they have any new construction out here? Maybe I can qualify. She said, you think so? <laughs> I said, maybe. We don't know unless we try, right? And make a long story short, she did an application. She looked around and she showed me some new construction in a nice neighborhood. And I'm like, yeah. She was lightening my world. Through Christ, of course, God was opening up the door. And I put in the application and I qualified to get a brand new house built. From a little place, living in a house, sharing a house, to coming into the place where we can own our own house. God was lightening my world, folks. He was doing for me what he wanted me to do as I grew in him. We got that house, the payment was less than what we would pay in the rent. And it was a nice house. Matter of fact, when we bought James home, he was born, we brought him to a brand new house. It smelled new, the carpet's fresh. I mean, and then the Lord blessed me, I got some extra money, and I was able to furnish it and make a nice room for him. And of course, for me and my wife and I, and I looked at my wife, I'm like, see? <laughs> You said you want your house for you want your own house, right? We moved from sharing a house into a brand new house. Got to pick out the carpet, the colors of the roof, and the colors of this and all of that. And I'm like, look what the Lord is doing. He lightened our world. And just as he lightened our world, it's our job. Somebody said, what's our job, Pastor? Our job. To lighten other people's world. <coughs> Even when they don't see hope themselves, it's our job. It's incumbent upon every Christian to lighten somebody's world. Oh, you know, maybe you're not able to buy them a big house and put them in a new house. But maybe you can buy some grocery for them. Maybe you can buy some toys for some of their children. Y'all hear me? You can do something, just like we do here at the center, we do something to try to lighten somebody else's world and not just our own world. Amen? Amen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just had to share that parenthetically. My wife, I'm sure she doesn't mind because God has blessed us with many houses since then. <laughs> and as a result, we were able to lighten other people's world by the blessings that he brought into our life. Yeah, called real estate investing. <laughs> it not only blessed us, but we were able to bless others. Even since we've been here in Florida, we were able to bless others as a result of what God has done for us. We were able to enlighten somebody else's world. Amen? Amen. Yeah. What does that look like again? Second Kings 6, 15 through 18. Listen, when King Aram came to make war with Israel, the servant looked out early in the morning and saw a huge army with chariots. And he came running back to Elisha in fear. Elisha was the prophet, and the prophet asked God, he said, Lord, open his eyes. Because he came back and told Elisha, man, we were surrounded. The armies are all over the place. There are chariots and armies and horses, and they're going to take us out. Literally, that's what he was saying. He told Elisha this. And Elisha says, well, not so fast. And I'm kind of paraphrasing. He asked God, he said, Lord, open his eyes that he can see that there are more with us than there are against us. And God opened the servant's eyes so that he could see. And when he went back and looked, his anxiety went away. Why? His fear went away. Why? Because God enlightened him and opened his eyes so that he can see what was really going on. Sometimes, what are you saying, Pastor? Sometimes as Christians, if we're not careful, we'll be paying more attention to the secular world around us and what's going on in our individual lives than we are giving credit to what God is doing supernaturally. See, when I was in that one bedroom sharing that one room with, with this mother in California, I could have looked at that little world and said, well, I guess this is my world and this is the way it is and this is the way it's going to be. But I didn't get stuck on that. 
Y'all hear me? I didn't get stuck on that. I knew the God I served was able, as the scripture said, now unto him, is it Ephesians? Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above anything I can imagine or think. But it's according to the faith that's working in me, right? Otherwise, I had to have faith to believe that God can do better by us than that. He was doing wonderful by us because, like I said, at the time, we did not need a big house. We did not need it for a long term because we were only there temporarily. But soon as we were able to be at a place at a length of time, God said, now I'll show you what I can do. You love me and you lighten in my world by being in worship and, and sharing of your tithe and your gifts that you have, what little you have. He said, now let me show you how I lighten your world. And he blessed us to get a brand new house built from the ground and the payments were within our reach. How many ever gotten in over your head? Anybody ever gotten in over your head? Sometimes you get in, especially during the holiday season, you see stuff and your eyes are a little bit bigger than your wallet. Oh yeah, I need this, I want this, I want this. And you get all this stuff on it and you, know, you put it on your credit card. It's good for 30 days. You don't see nothing, you won't worry about it for 30 days. But I mean, after 30 days, you start getting stuff in the mail. And some of them, you know, forgot. Oh, my goodness, I did put that over there, did I? And if I don't pay it in 30 days, guess what happened? I got to pay them some extra interest, which makes my problem worse, right? Oh, come on now, y'all know what I'm talking about. Make your problem worse. So, in other words, what am I doing? I'm not lightening my world. I'm making my world darker. <laughs> because now when I get these bills... And I realize my paycheck is smaller than what I need to pay out. It causes some kind of anxiety, doesn't it? Causes a little stress. And you begin to come, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? And then Am Scott said, hey, come, come to me. Am Scott said, come to me. I'll let you have $500. And all you need to do is have an ID. And how many of us have fallen into that trap? That's a serious trap. Don't do that. Because the kind of interest Am Scott going to charge y'all. Anybody ever know? Anybody familiar with Am Scott? I don't fool with Am Scott. And I'm encouraging everybody I know. Don't fool with Am Scott. Listen, strive to work within your means. Strive to use discipline enough to stay within your budget. Because the Lord says, listen, he's not going to leave you. He's not going to forsake you. But he also says in these verses, learn to be content where you are until God open up a door for you to do better. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. Hey, if I'm going to get raised in six months, let me just wait till I get the raise. Don't let me stop putting stuff on my card and buying this stuff in the hopes of the raise. Stuff might change. In six months, man, they can say, I don't need you no more. And if I done built up a bunch of charges on my card, I done went and bought stuff I really probably should have waited for, now I find myself in a dilemma. And that's not really God's fault, is it, Mother? <laughs> she said, no. That's not God's fault. That because that's simply me not using good discipline and good judgment, and I find myself in a bind. That makes it difficult for me. What am I saying? It makes it more difficult for me to lighten somebody else's world if I'm in a jam myself. Yeah. Right? It makes it hard for me to go out and what well, I'm gonna take them out to lunch. I'm gonna treat them today. No, I don't have enough. Oh, I'm gonna pay for their, their groceries. What? I don't have, I need somebody to pay for my girls. <laughs> yeah, y'all get my picture, don't you? So the bottom line is, when we can lighten somebody else's world, God continues to lighten our world as we lighten somebody else's world, right? So Elisha the prophet, when he prayed, and God opened his eyes, opened that servant's eyes, the servant was now able to encourage others in a positive way as he lived his life through a clearer screen. And that's what I'm trying to, trying to tell us this morning. Sometimes our way might look a little gloomy. Sometimes the rain might get a little blurry. But you ever been in a car when it was foggy? And you, you, know, you can see, but you couldn't see quite that clear. You turn your windshield wipers on, and as soon as they swipe it, it's clear. But then two seconds, it collide back up. Then you have to go to your... Uh, your defaults, right? You turn on your uh, your defaults so to take some of the stuff off the windshield, right? And as 
what was once cloudy and very blurry before, once that defrost began to hit the window, you, you'd be like that song, I can see clearer now. Yep. It looks better, right? That's the way God is in our life, folks. When he comes into our life, listen, we become the light to the world. And the light that he's given us enables us to lighten somebody else's world. And I know sometimes we say, oh, I don't have it. I can't do it. But no, let's, let's not be like this servant in Elijah in 2 Kings and, and start doubting because of what we see. No, let's go to our superpower. God is our superman. <laughs> He's our superman, man. Listen, when you feel like you can't do it within your own power and you see something that you believe God has put in your heart to do to help somebody else, go to him and say, Lord, open my eyes so I can see how I can do this. And just like God opened this man's eye so he realized, hey, you don't have to walk in fear. You don't have to walk in anxiety. I've already made a way. God will do the same thing for us as Christians, right? Because sometimes, when I say sometimes, things are going to look gloom to you. It's going to look like there's no way I can do that. You're going to see a need, and it's going to be like your baby leap in the womb. You can say, wow, man, if I can help them, I sure would. But don't stop there. Let's take it a step further and say, God, open my eyes and let me see how I can. What can I do to help? Because like this servant, in his flesh, he saw the walls caving in. He saw the armies bigger and they were outnumbered by whatever. And he was doubting and he was afraid. But when the, when the prophet said, Lord, open his eyes so that he can see how he can, how we're going to overcome them. God opened his eyes. And he realized now, oh, I don't have to worry. Anxiety can go away. Because I see you. I can see clearer now. And the light of God within us, folks, helps us to see clearer. Opposition on your job may look very bleak. It looks like they may start talking about layoffs or downsizing and all of that. But listen, don't be fearful. Don't get all anxious. Just say, Lord, open my eyes. Show me what I should do. And let the Lord, through, through vision and through insight, tell you and show you how to navigate through it. Because, listen, if I can get afraid and because I'm hearing of them laying off and I can go running. But then I might get news later on and say, oh, yeah, they didn't have to lay off anybody. Everybody stayed still working. And, and I've already taken off. Mm -hmm. And I probably end up with something less than what I was doing here. Because what? I didn't ask God to give me insight on what to do. I didn't ask him to lighten my world because I want to be able to be a blessing to other people. I just saw it like that servant and I became afraid and I ran. That makes sense? Let's not do that. As Christians, let's go back to God and say, Lord, this is my desire. I desire to do this, this, and this. I've had people say, you know, I desire to pay tithe, but I can't afford to pay tithe. Huh? You cannot... You really can't afford not to. Because again, Ella James talked about it the other Sunday. That's where the blessings begin to flow monetarily. Because he said, if I give to his kingdom, he's going to take care of me. It's like an investment, isn't it? It's like, it's like, uh, it's like, putting, it's, it's, just, it's better than the stock market because the stock market crashes sometimes. <laughs> but when you're giving it to the kingdom, God's going to remember. He said, I'm not. Uh, how you say that thing? I'm not unrighteous to forget your labor of love, what you did to my kingdom and how you supported my kingdom. I'm not going to forget that. So, again, when I lighten the world of the Christian community, I, I lighten the world of the church and make the, the, the load easier for the church, God says, I'm going to lighten your world and make things a little easier for you. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. His word assured us, secondly, his word assured us that no weapon or enemy that's formed against us is going to prosper. It's not going to stop us. But what it will do, it's going to work together to bring glory to God and to bless us. That's in Isaiah 54, 17. 
It says, no weapon formed against you going to prosper. And, you know, we've got all kind, of pros all kind of weapons, right? What are some of the enemies, some of the weapons that come against us? Weapons of doubt. Anybody ever doubted? Weapons of fear. Weapons of trouble, like I used that just now. You know, oh, I'm hearing that they're going to lay off and I may not have a job, you know. That's a weapon coming against you. The pandemic. Oh, there's another flurry of the Omicron. That puts fear in people's heart, doesn't it? And it's real, right? Yeah. I'm not telling you not to, not to face reality, but I'm saying after we face reality, let's go to God. And say, Lord, now how do you want me to handle this? Because sometimes, somebody say sometimes, sometimes, the news that you hear, especially the negative news, it's not for you to run and tuck out and take off. It's for you to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. In other words, God is ready to work a miracle for you. But if I run away from it, I release him of working a miracle for me. How many of you need to work some miracles for you? I need him to work some miracles for me. Because listen, some stuff that he's called me to do, folks, I can't do by myself. I need God to help me. I need him to create something. I need him to do something supernatural to help me do what he's called me to do. And he's called you to help me do it. But sometimes I need more than just you. I need him to do something extra. Anybody ever need something extra? <laughs> God can, he can cause it to happen, yeah. <coughs> what about our own insecurities, man? Sometimes that's a weapon that's formed against me. My own insecurities. And nobody's never did it like this before. And I don't have nobody in my family that has ever done this. I'm not so sure if I can do it. It doesn't matter whether you're talking about going back to school or starting your own business or whether you're talking about getting married. You don't trust it. I uh, never trust nobody like that because the last person hurt me. And I don't, you know, no, 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 no. We have to put all of that stuff to the side and say, Lord, I want you to direct me. I want you to help me to see clearer. Because, listen, I want you to lighten my world so that I can lighten the world of those that come around me. That makes sense, y'all? And listen, the Lord is open to, to helping us do those things when our heart is pure and we want to do it not to be seen, not to be high-minded, not to be saying, hey, look what I've done, no. But I'm doing it because I believe the Lord, if you help me to lighten my world in this particular area, I'll be able to lighten somebody else's world. That should be our ultimate goal, right? Not only to benefit ourselves, but to benefit those around us. Just like you guys coming to this church. Listen, I don't want anybody that comes to this church to be living in poverty. Living in poverty. One year go by, two years go by, they're still living in poverty. Five years, they're still living in poverty. Listen, that bothers me because that speaks something about Pastor James. You all say, huh? Yeah. My job is to try to enlighten you and enlighten your world so that you can see clearer. You can have a bigger vision for yourself of what God wants to do in your life. Not just, oh, I'm happy, so I'm just concerned about me and my four and no more. No, God wouldn't have me to live like that. For a long time, I wouldn't even buy me a new car. I'd just buy some old, uh, get me a decent little car, and i just keep driving and keep driving. Because I'm like, Lord, I don't want to be driving better than what the congregation is doing. One day the Lord checked me with that. He said, you give them the word and show them the pattern. It's up to them to follow the pattern. That makes sense? Now he said, if they don't follow the pattern, that's not on you. But if you fail to give them the pattern, it's on you. So I told my wife, I said, listen, we're going to live. <laughs> we're going to live. We're not going to sit and try to wait for everybody else to catch up, no. We're going to give them the word, try to teach them by precept and example, and show them the way, and hopefully they'll catch on, they'll lighten their world, and they'll follow in. But if I wait for everybody to catch on, guess what? It'll never happen, right? <laughs> It'll never happen because everybody's not going to catch on, even though we would like for them to catch on. Yeah, 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 yeah. So insecurity sometimes works against us. That's like a weapon against us. Because if I'm insecure, and 
I'm insecure about my relationship. I'm insecure about, you know, what I'm able to do. I need to just remember that verse that says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Hey, I may not have the right education. I might not meet all of the qualifications. But if I can believe that in my head and transform my mind to think that, listen, I can do this through God if he's helping me. <laughs> That's how Paul says we need to transform our mind. It's through the word of the Lord. Because if I listen to everybody else, sometimes if you listen, even listening to your friends, if your friends are people that have not did anything much in their life, and you talk to them about your dream, guess what they're going to say? Child, please. You can't do that. <laughs> you tell them, you know what? I believe God want me to go back to school. And I'm, Child, you know you struggled in school. How are you talking about going back to school? You're going to look at them and tell them it's a new day. And you just shut up. I'm not listening to you. <laughs> I just had to talk to the hand because the... <laughs> And you have to do it respectfully. Well, can you really do that respectfully? I don't know. I'm moving on. But the bottom line is, even our insecurities, folks, we have to. <laughs> Hallelujah. We have to get over our insecurities because sometimes, when I say sometimes, sometimes, we are our best, our worst critic. We are our worst enemy. We talk ourselves out of something that's in our heart, and we know God is putting it in our heart. And we'll talk ourselves out of what God has put in our heart. Romans 8, 28 again assures us that all things, not some things, and let me set this up for you, because a lot of times Romans 8, 28 is a, is a message for those of us that run into a lot of opposition. Anybody ever ran into opposition? You know something's in your heart and you're trying to get done, but look like one thing, you run into one opposition after the other, Another opposition after that, and look at the thing just keep working against you. Well, you know what? Maybe it's not working against you. Your emotions telling you that it's working against you, but maybe it's not working against you. If this scripture is right, and we believe it is right, Paul said in Romans eight twenty eight, and we know. So in other words, this is something that we got to grow to and put grips on and, and hold on to it. And we know, somebody say, I know, I know. that all things are working together for my good. And he didn't say everything that's going to work was going to be good. He didn't even say it's going to be good for you at the time. But God said, the word said, he'll work it for your good. Somebody say, prove it, Pastor. Prove it, Pastor. You all remember in Genesis chapter 50? When, when uh, this is near the end of it, but in, I think it started around about <coughs> Genesis 35 when uh, Joseph was being mistreated. Start out, he was mistreated by his brothers. They hated him because he was the baby. <laughs> Thank God we don't hate our baby. <laughs> <laughs> but they, were, they hated him because they thought his father was favoring him, right? And the father had a nice coat made of him of many colors. I don't know whether that was like a gay coat or what kind of coat it was. But it was a, <laughs> it was a coat of many colors. You know, if you think about that today, that's what people would think. But God, the scripture says he had him a nice coat made. And the father, the children thought the father was showing favoritism. So the children plotted against Joseph to have him destroyed, even killed. Y'all read that sometimes. Start around Genesis 35. Just kind of walk through that, that passage. Those guys, his daddy said, I want you to go check on your brothers. Now I'm trying to make this short. Go check on your brothers and, uh, and take them some goods because they're out there, you know, they, they're taking care of business. He goes out to check on them. And when he gets there, they say, oh, I'm coming. And they captured him. And they say, you know what? We don't like you anyway. <laughs> now we got you all to ourselves. We can destroy you. They threw him down in a well. They let him down into a deep well. Think of it, the water going to drown him. Then they went and, 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 and took his jacket and soaked it in, killed an animal, and they soaked it in an animal blood. And they, they took it back and showed his daddy. and said, Daddy, see, look at this, Daddy. His daddy thought, oh, my goodness. My son, that's his jacket. Yeah. Smell that blood. Oh. He was killed, and they made their daddy believe that the son was killed. But 
one of the brothers said, let's not kill him, let's bring him back up out of the well, which was a good thing, right? They brought him up out of the well, and they saw these Ishmaelites coming through in their little chariots, and they said, you know what, let's just sell this bull. <laughs> and they sold him. They sold him into slavery. And these guys obviously, okay, yeah, we'll use them. They went on into Egypt. And they said, okay, we'll get rid of it. Well, Potiphar said, I can use somebody in my house and working around the house. So they let Potiphar have it. This guy was well off. Doing very well. Here Joseph is now. Was let down in a, in a pit. Pulled out and sold into slavery. He goes into Egypt. Potiphar takes him and put him to work. And no doubt Joseph said, oh, thank God I, I'm in a good place now. All I got to do is just maintain this stuff, this nice mansion, and do my work here. And then his wife, part of his wife, accused him of raping her. Somebody should sit back. Again. And poor little Joseph, I don't know what, a, what kind of Jew they had, but I guess it was rigged. They didn't even hear his side, probably. They just threw him in the prison. Another setback, right? And lo and behold, Joseph kept lightening the people's world around him, though. Even when he was in prison, there was a baker and a butler in there, and they did some crazy stuff. But Joseph was able to tell them, encourage them. They had dreams. He interpreted their dreams. Otherwise, he was lightening their world, even while he was suffering and going through himself. Long story short, Joseph told him, now, you guys get out. Well, both of them got out, but he told them one of them was going to be killed and the other was going to survive. But he said, when you get out now, make sure you tell the king, remember me, so he can get me out of here too. You know, they got out and got what they wanted, and they forgot about it. That's another setback, right? Because he would have thought, man, they're going to call me, because then they get out, and they're going to call and say, oh yeah, Joseph was a good man, he was doing good in the prison and all of that. Let him out too. They didn't remember him a couple years go by. And all of a sudden, the king needed somebody to interpret their dream. Y'all can read about it. And the, the, the dream, nobody could interpret it. His magicians, his soothsayers, none of them that normally would interpret his dream, none of them could interpret his dream. So Joseph, the guy finally thought, he said, you know what? I know somebody might be able to interpret the dream. When I was in prison, this guy called Joseph. He interpreted our dream, and I believe he can interpret your dream. Finally, now they go and send for Joseph. Out of everything that happened against Joseph, you would have thought Joseph would have got bitter. He would have became more angry and self-centered and selfish. But that scripture that says that Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for good, it was certainly working for, for good for Joseph. Because when he came out and interpreted the dream, guess what? The king said, oh man, you wonderful. I need you. I'm going to put you over everything I've got. He was in charge of getting the crops in and harvesting them and storing it up. Because the, 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 the dream said there's going to be seven years of good, good times. And then there's going to be seven years of famine. And... He said, who's best to handle this? Because you interpret it, I'm going to put you in charge of it. Yeah. And when the famine hit, folks, guess who came looking for food? The same ones that stepped on Joseph, his family, his brothers, those that tried to kill him. And the bottom of the story is, what they were meant doing for evil, God was working it out for their good. To put Joseph in place, so that he'll be there to help not only his own family, but the whole nation of them that would come into Egypt. He would be able to help them with food and shelter and clothing and all of this stuff. So don't worry about your enemies. Continue to lighten their world. Even when they're hating you and they're player hating and talking about you and trying to drag your name through the mud. Hey, don't worry about it. Don't get in the, don't get in the mud with them. What you saying, Pastor? Don't get in the mud with them. They're helping God help you. <laughs> even though they don't realize it, they're only helping God help you to get you in a place where God wants you to be. 
But if you hold on to grudges and you continue to hate, and instead of lighting other people's world around it, you get in a pity party, I'm not going to help anybody. I'm not going to care no more. I'm just going to look out for myself and nobody else. It might be a cold day before God begin to open up the road for you. But if you continue to ask God, Lord, help me to lighten somebody else's world. Help me to share love. Help me to share to share what I have with other people for the good. Help me to do the do the right thing, to lift people up and not try to put them down. Because sometimes, when I say sometimes, sometimes, people are more interested in trying to put their head, put their feet on somebody than they are in lifting you up. Sometimes even in relationships. It happens, right? Remember, so Joseph said, the scripture said, what the enemy meant for evil, that's in Genesis 50, 19 and 20, they plotted maliciously against him, but what they were doing, they were really helping God get Joseph in place to where God wanted Joseph to be. What about your life? Have you ever looked at your life and wondered why I'm not farther advanced with my life? I had a plan to be here, but I'm here. I had a plan to be doing this. Who knows if God is strategically working things out in such a way because the persons or people that are supposed to be working with you to get to a certain place, maybe they're not in place yet. Maybe they're doing crazy stuff. And God is still working on them, trying to get them to get into the right place so that you guys can get to a good place together. Who knows what God is doing? But if I can remember the scripture, I know no matter what's coming against me, I just believe all things are working together for my good because I love God and I'm called according to his purpose. So it doesn't matter what happened. Remember I told you at the beginning, it's not how, it's not what happens to us, it's how we respond to what happens to us, right? So if I can respond in the right way, and certainly we're going to mess it up sometimes because flesh is flesh. Sometimes you're going to intend to say the right thing and do the right thing, and you're going to still do it the wrong way. But that's okay, right? Just get up. Ask God to forgive me. Lord, I messed that up. I knew I was supposed to go right, and I went left because my flesh got in the way. Just be honest with God. And watch God help you to put it back together and put you back on the journey that he's called you on. How many of you really want what God's got for you? I want what God's got for me. I don't want to get to heaven and all happen to be saved and going. And oh, I made it in the gate and sit down and the Lord started talking to me. He said, how did your life go? Oh, man, good Lord. I did this and did that. And the Lord said, yeah, but you didn't do all that. I had a whole lot more for you. But you let doubt get in the way. You let your insecurities get in the way. And you let people talk you out of stuff. Then you'll be like, I'm glad to be here. But man, I could have capitalized on that, right? I don't want to have that kind of regret. I want to be able to capitalize on everything that God's got in store for me. Amen. So lighten your world and your relationships. Lighten your world. Sometimes people are going to do something that's close to you that's going to make you upset. Lighten your world. Tell them, I forgive you. It's okay. And then you go and ask God, Lord, now you help me <laughs> to make this real. I don't want to just say it. And still be holding a grudge, right? Because God knows our heart, right? right? So ask God, now you help me. I told him I'm sorry and I forgive him. Now, Lord, you help me to genuinely forgive him. Because if you don't, guess what happens? Don't they do something else? I told you. <laughs> it flares back up again, right? Listen, and it's okay. A lot of times spouses have real in relationships. Sometimes we don't always agree, but that's okay too, right? And I'm running into something that's real, and I'm closing. I'm running into a situation that really that I didn't realize people do. And I've probably been guilty of it myself. Sometimes people will say, thank you. Or, would you, would you accept my apology? Or, thank you. And, you know, sometimes people have a, have a hard time to say, you're welcome. Right. I'm glad to do it for you. Sometimes people struggle with that. For whatever reason, they might think they're all high and mighty, and I don't have to say thank you. I don't have to say you're welcome. You know, they have to say, well, you know, I did it for you, so get over it. No, no, no. Somebody do something for you, and you tell them, if I tell you thank you, say, reply back. You're welcome. I'm glad that I was able to do it. Don't just sit there and pretend like it was your duty to tell me thank you. I didn't have to tell you thank you, right? 
So let's make sure we reciprocate that because sometimes I think people have some kind of feeling about saying, you're welcome. Let's practice that. Tell me, you're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. Sometimes spouses get into that thing. Now. Hey, oh, you know I appreciate it. Well, yeah, I, I think I know, but I want to hear it. You told me, I told you, thank you for bringing me the coffee. You only said, well, you're welcome, dear. Don't just say, well, you know, you're married. A lot of married folk don't do that. Right? <laughs> yeah. So let's reciprocate it. That's, that's lightening the world, lightening our world. We, give me, if we got kids and grandkids around and they see us doing it the right way, guess what? We are lighting their world too because they're coming up and they're watching the way we handle stuff. Amen. Yeah. I'm going to finish this another Sunday. But y'all get my point, don't you? Amen. We are lighting people's world around us in whatever way, small or great. Not only just during the holiday season, but let's carry it on into the new year and make it a part of our lifestyle. That's what the Lord wants, right? Mm -hmm. He wants it to be a part of our lifestyle. That's why he said, you are the light of the world. You are like that city that sits on the hill that cannot be hidden. And when we can live that way, my friends, I truly decree and declare that our lives will change for the better. Because God will see our heart. He'll see our willingness to share and to help and encourage other people. Till God will start doing what that one scripture said. The eyes of the Lord goes to and fro in the earth. Seeking those whom he can show himself strong in their life. I want to be one of those kind of people. I want God to be looking for me. Oh yeah, I can find James because I know if I bless him here, he's going to spread it. If I help him in this area, he's going to be able to share it. He's going to share the love. He's going to share the kindness. And his love will continue to go on. Amen? Amen. Let me pray. For those of you that might be watching virtually and those that are here, I want you to learn and to not just learn, but to understand that we are called to lighten our world. So, Father, as we pray for these that are here, and those that are watching virtually, we thank you for your word encouraging us, even during this holiday season, but not just during this season, but every day. Let us look for ways and chances and opportunities that we can lighten somebody's world, that we can lighten their load. We can help them in some kind of way, maybe even if it's just a word of encouragement to let them know that you can do this. You can rise up. You don't have to stay stuck. You don't have to stay in, a, in the same rut that you're in, but God can help you to get up, and I'm here to help you do my part, and let's trust God together. I pray that you bless us in our relationships. Bless us as we go forward. Bless us in our neighborhood. Let us be able to lighten our world in our neighborhood, getting to know our neighbors, showing them that we care. If there are some elderly ones living around us or close by, help us, God, to reach out to them in a loving way. So many simple ways that we can show our light and let people know that we are concerned and that we care. And as a result, Father, I decree and declare that you are moving in your power, moving by your spirit to pour more into us as we pour out to help others. Let us never be just concerned about my family and no more. But let us be broad-minded. Let us have the mind of Christ. Let us think about others as we think about ourselves. And help us to be the light of the world. Let us be the salt in the earth. Spreading love and kindness even as we go. We thank you for it, and we bless your name for it, and we ask these in Jesus' name. And can we say amen? Amen. 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 God amen. bless you. God bless you. I was trying to give you my whole story here, but uh, I'm going to save the rest of it for another.